1972, the Royal Air Force team, the Red Arrows, firm base at Kemble, was through Stornoway, Isle of Lewis, Keflavik, Iceland, Sonderstrom, inside the Arctic Circle in Greenland, to Frobisher Bay on Baffin Island. At this Eskimo settlement, the team ground crew replenished and inspected the gnats at temperatures down to 20 degrees below freezing, with chill factor added, while the pilots prepared for the last airborne leg to the North American continent. This would be the long trip down the Newfoundland coast to Goose Bay, Labrador. After a minimum of delay at Frobisher, the Nats took off, followed by the two Hercules aircraft of Royal Air Force Strike Command, which were providing logistic support for the operation by carrying almost a complete Nat in spare parts, as well as dozens of spare tires and other sundries required for the team's aircraft. At Goose Bay, the permanent Royal Air Force detachment hosted the team, who took a day's rest and gave the aircraft a post arc inspection. We realised we had successfully crossed the Atlantic and could concentrate on the job of representing the Royal Air Force and Britain in front of the millions of people we hoped would watch our display. Refreshed and now in their familiar red suits, the team headed for the Canadian Armed Forces Base at Trenton on Lake Ontario where they were met by the station commander, Colonel Paisley. The detachment commander, Air Commodore Crompton, commandant of the Central Flying School, arrived with the Hercules transports, and preparations were made for a four-day stay to tune the display to concert pitch. During this practice period, Colonel Paisley flew with the team leader, squadron leader Dick, during a sequence of manoeuvres and witnessed at first hand the skill and judgement required to lead a team of nine aircraft through such a complicated display. Following each sortie, the team held a comprehensive debrief of the display, giving each member the chance to comment on his own performance and the overall result. At this stage, the team manager offered his own criticism from the spectator's viewpoint. Eventually the team was ready, and the commandant joined Flight Lieutenant Aspinall in his aircraft for the flight south to Washington. Transpo 72 was the transportation exposition which originally invited the team to the United States and we were welcomed with traditional enthusiasm. The exposition itself occupied half the area of Dulles International Airport, just outside Washington DC. On peak viewing days, more than half a million people would attend the various displays. The day after arrival, the team gave its first performance. Takeoff from the long, wide runway was spectacular. The famous Concord flypast preceded the loop and formation change to Feathered Arrow. From crowd right, the team commences the wine glass roll. 
the only team in the world to roll five aircraft in line abreast. Halfway through the show, the synchronized pair leave the other seven aircraft, which loop and break from Vixen formation. The team manager directs people's attention to the approaching pair, an opposition barrel roll. The main formation executes individual twinkle rolls and the pair cross again. Leader's benefit formation is followed by the cascade break. the synchronized pair finale with the double undercarriage roll. With nine aircraft together again, the team loops for the final bomb burst. The taxi back to the parking area affords a good view of other exhibits and the aviation trade chalets. As usual, the pilots and manager debrief the display. And soon, the Air Officer Commanding and Chief Training Command, Air Marshal Sir Leslie Maver and Lady Maver, arrived to congratulate the team. Simultaneously, the Air Member for Personnel, Air Chief Marshal Sir Lewis Hodges, meets several of the ground crew. Meanwhile, out on the taxiway, the pilots are relaxing in small electric carts, loan them for quick transport between car park and aircraft. Another day, another show. The team is being filmed for television this time, even during a display briefing. Squadron leader Dick has his own interrogation later. <laughs> the Vice President of the United States, Spiro Agnew, arrives amid much excitement and meets the Commandant of the Central Flying School, for this is a command performance. The honour guard is trooped and everyone waits for the Red Arrows to open the show.
A good show, well flown and much appreciated. June the 1st is the Queen's official birthday and the team officers attend a reception given at the British Embassy. The ambassador, Lord Cromer, toasts Her Majesty. And so the team flies on to Reading, Pennsylvania, where on the first day it is faced with weather similar to that of a British autumn. Accordingly, the team presents its flat show, designed for just such a contingency. In very poor conditions, the team banks and turns, showing all its usual precision regardless of the bad visibility. Thankfully, the next day dawns bright and cloudless. The Sheriff of Reading City presented cards of introduction to team members to mark the occasion of their visit. Right from engine start-up, it was obvious that these magnificent surroundings would frame a full display beautifully and everyone was determined to produce a perfect performance. It felt like a good one, and sure enough, the audience at the display thought so too. Off the team flew onto St. Catharines in the Niagara district of Ontario, back to Canada, and what a welcome they gave us.
even taxing in on arrival as part of the show before we have flown a single manoeuvre. Everyone took the opportunity to see Niagara Falls on their day off, still not really being able to believe they were there. Once again, there was perfect weather. The ground crew performed their final checks and the team pilots climb in. A full display start up this time for the ground crew and out to the runway for takeoff. Diamond fly pass. Concorde fly past and change to feathered arrow in the loop. Wine glass roll. Double undercarriage roll. The team performed its usual polished display to the delight of the Canadian spectators. However, all good things come to an end, and soon we found ourselves flying northeast to Goose Bay. The Nats arrived in traditional manner, regardless of the fact they were obliged to carry long range fuel tanks. Next day, the team met its faithful Vulcan Shepard aircraft again, waiting to navigate over the barren Arctic as it had done so well on the westbound trip. The return flight made use of the same airfields as before, including Sonderstrom inside the Arctic Circle, which looks so much more hospitable now than it had a month previously when under snow and ice. Our two support Hercules aircraft arrived promptly to join the Vulcans and Nats on the airfield's huge parking area. As though feeling nearly home and dry, the ground crew pulled the Nats out by hand next day for the flight to Keflavik, which only served to remind the team that they were back in Europe again because it was raining. Not just raining, but pouring from a minimum cloud base. We really were paying for our good weather in the States. All the same, the team wouldn't have missed it for the world. <laughs>